Hi, I'm Debbie Mores. Once again, welcome to Legal Matters, the program that's been designed to address the critical and sometimes contentious issues that are facing businesses and consumers today. It's legal information, it's practical solutions, and straight talk about a wide variety of topics that will affect your home and your work life. Today we're going to take a closer look at the inside of the law firm, the work particularly of paralegals, their roles, their responsibilities, and the legal and ethical limitations that they have. Of course, they're there to increase the law firm's efficiency, and we're going to learn about that. But more importantly, we'll help you learn how to work with them a little bit more efficiently and a little more effectively. And to do that, we've expanded our panel today. So once again, from Audette Bazaar Cadero Grasso Law Firm in East Providence, we have straight across David Bazaar. Mm -hmm. And to my left, we have Cheryl Marrow. We have Cindy Lopes. And to her left, we have Elia Jamiel. Elia. Elia. Excuse me, Elia, thank you. <laughs> so um, let's start with you for a moment, David. Uh, what are the rules of engagement? So if a client comes to you and says, we want to enlist your services, um, at what point do you start to enlist the work and the services of a paralegal? How does that play out? Somebody comes in, let's just use an example of an auto accident, and I do the intake, and our firm lawyers really do all the intakes with clients, meet with the client to assess the case, discuss with the client what their expectations should be, how a case is managed. From the moment um, that file has been put on my desk because we've done the intake, it goes to the paralegal and they open the file and do all of the work setting up the file and getting it ready to um, be handled by the firm. How many do you have at your office? All right, how many paralegals do we have all together? You doing the math? I think we of have you. six. 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 And how do you decide which of them is going to work on a case? Do they have specialties, areas of specialty, as many do? Right. And I, I brought a good cross sample because these folks have done a little bit of everything during their time. But we do basically have some specialization in the firm. Um, Cheryl, for example, does mostly Social Security and auto accidents right now. Mm -hmm. And Cindy is doing family court and the probate yes. files. Do you do some bankruptcy too? No. Okay, no that's Liz. And Ellie is doing workers' comp mass in Rhode Island? Yes. Okay. So they've done a little bit of that. That's what they do now, but they've done other things during the course of their uh, paralegal careers. Okay, so Cindy, for example, what's your background? How did you get to become a paralegal? Okay, I started off as a legal secretary, um, and then uh, Roger Williams College um, started a paralegal program. Um, I then had to get three letters of recommendation from attorneys. I had my college background and I had my years of working as a legal secretary and that's how I got into the paralegal program. How long is the program, Cheryl? Uh, I didn't start that way. Okay. Um, uh, mine's a little bit different. I was attending um, Sawyer School of Business for administrative assistant and um, I was working part-time for Social Security Administration and I met one of the attorneys who then hired me and I basically had um, hands-on training. OJT. On the job training, yeah. Oh, good. And yeah. so, Cindy, you did take that class. So how long is a program? The program that? I took back then, that was back in the mm -hmm. 80s, um, there were eight courses that I had to take. Um, I and they were all law-type courses because I already had a degree. I see. And Elia, was your background similar to? Yeah, I, um, I went to CCRI and I got an associates in paralegal and that was about two years. And then I went over to Rhode Island College and I have an associates degree in um, justice studies, criminal um, studies, and that was four years. But I believe the paralegal, to get a bachelor's degree in paralegal, um, is about four years. I see. So you, there are different ways to approach it, yes. obviously. So, Elliot, tell me, what does a day in the life of a paralegal look like? What do you do? Um, let's see. Um, well, if you want to start with what David said about getting a file to us after he meets with um, a client, um, we um, gather all the information um, we have, to, depending on what it is. Um, we usually send out a, a letter thanking the client to come in to our firm and then we um, they give us a checklist of everything that needs to be done basically we request medical records then we have to follow up on that um, let's see um, answer Join phone in. calls uh, clients walk in and out every day and um, with me with workman's comp 
a client could call in because maybe a check hasn't come in, so we have to follow up with the insurance company for that, make sure that they're getting their weekly checks in. It varies from day to day, but it's just busy, busy, busy. <laughs> what can't a paralegal do? Um, we can't give legal advice. Mm -hmm. uh, that we have to um, have them speak with the attorney if they ask a legal question. I call that the yeah. difference between the what may be and the why. They want to know mm -hmm. what's going on on their file. Paralegals know probably better than anybody. If they want to know why we're doing something specifically in terms of a petition workers' comp being filed or a particular letter going to an insurance company, that would be the attorney's responsibility to speak to the client and explain why we're doing something. I see. Do you ever have an occasion where um, you're asked what the fees will be for services and if it is, how? That I can see that li logically a client might ask that. What do you say? Yes, they do. Um, there's some uh, areas of law where there's already um, predetermined fees. Um, I think family law has a retainer, or pretty much a retainer, but personal injury, um, we have a retainer agreement where it's stated in there it's usually about a third of the settlement, only if it settles. Right, and that um, is um, something that the attorney would have addressed on the mm -hmm. initial intake. Right. So usually they probably wouldn't get that particular question directly. Mm -hmm. It would be more of when can I expect my settlement to come in so sure. that's when our fee would get paid. Well, yeah. and under those circumstances, these people are doing work that's important to you, and if you have a contingency case, they still have to get paid. They're never paid on contingency, are they? They still have to be the paid. The paralegals. Yes. And, um, you can ask them that. Are you guys paid on contingency? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> They're <laughs> smiling. So <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> no, uh, but we do manage our time that we put on a case. How so? Um, when I work on a uh, divorce case, um, after I, let's say I, when I initially open up the file and prepare all the documents, um, I go into time slips and it will, and I put the amount of time it, I spent working on those documents. Right. And, and they do different areas of law, so um, Cheryl That's probably wouldn't keep no, track, I don't of, keep her track type. of time. And Ellie probably for the most part don't unless it's an, a fee petition kind Correct. of case, mm -hmm. which would be more like electric boat, federal long yes. short. Mm -hmm. I understand that you as a lawyer are bound by confidentiality agreements, are they? Sure, they yes. work under the auspices of the attorney, um, so the same rules apply. We could have the paralegal in when we're having an intake or a conversation with the client, and that does not waive the attorney-client privilege. Okay. Would it be fair to say uh, you would do a lot of the deep background work, the research? Uh, do you get involved in discovery and interrogatories? Yes. yes. And yes. how does that work mm -hmm. if you're working with a client of the firm's? Uh, Elio or Cindy or um, probably the more Cindy's area. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I um, would send out the interrogatories to the client and ask them to uh, prepare their answers. Maybe you should explain what an interrogatory. An interrogatory. Is. <laughs> okay. I know you can. <laughs> it's, it's their questions um, designed for each case uh, that the party has to answer. It's part of the discovery portion of the case. Um, so once the client answers the questions and sends them to me, um, I review everything and then I would prepare the answers in final form. Okay, with the client. I would have the, sometimes the client comes in or sometimes I talk to them over the phone. And would you have to review that with the lawyer that you're working with first? Yes, before everything gets signed by the client, it's reviewed by the attorney. And, and how do you work with an attorney in your, uh, the area that you specialize in? Um, well, usually um, with personal injury and Social Security, um, nothing goes out until the attorney sees it. Um, they usually sign their own letters um, to make sure that the information that we're sending is correct. Is that that is true of all case in all cases That's correct, correct? Yes, yeah. that yeah. you have to sign it because right. they are not like but they do have a you do have a block of your own do, do you not that says you can sign certain documents maybe well, it's email. usually medical medical okay. um, cover letters to medical authorizations we can sign mm -hmm. for the attorney and we put our initials right so, yeah. but what happens uh, for example when we're opening up a file um, for an auto accident 
the initial checklist that Elliot was referring to will have send a letter of representation to the insurance company, send a letter of representation to the defendant if we don't know who the insurance company is. Um, those are pretty much standard letters that might have some nuances put in from the particular case. So the paralegal will prepare that kind of letter, bring it to the attorney to, to review to make sure there's nothing additional because of the type of case that it is that we want added, and then we'll sign it and send it out. But as uh, Cheryl's saying, we're going to just send a letter to the doctor with the medical authorization to send the medical records. And she could sign her own name as far as I'm concerned because it's a cover letter from the law firm just saying here is enclosed an authorization from the client to release the medical records. So a client who comes to you should feel very comfortable if they see their names versus yours on such a piece of paper that's just itemizing here's what's going on or here's a yeah, list. In, in fact, a lot of our clients would rather talk to them than to the lawyers <laughs> anyway. Let's talk about that. So apart from the fact that you're uh, very adept at dealing with the documentation and paperwork that must be copious at times, do you also get involved with um, interviewing a witness or witnesses or is that beyond the scope of your work? Not in work as comp, I wouldn't do that. The attorney would um, would do that as far as um, that is concerned. But mm -hmm. I think in other areas sometimes. Yeah, personal injury on the litigation side, um, the paralegal, I've done, um, I've spoken with witnesses and, um, you know, so forth. But in Social Security, no, usually not. And then pre-lit, um, not too much. It What's depends, pre -lit? but it's guided. Pre -lit, I'm sorry, pre-litigation is before it goes into suit, before okay. you file suit um, with the court. So it's at the direction of the attorney whether or not they need to speak to an, a witness before okay. um, on a case. And Cindy, Cindy yeah. do you work with? Um, in divorce cases, I don't need to uh, deal with witnesses. Uh, however, uh, in my past experience, um, I have gone and obtained witness statements okay. on um, like auto accident cases. And what about when you're getting involved with cases that get close to settlement versus going into litigation? Can you strike the deal, close the deal, uh, negotiate a deal? No. What are the parameters? No. Mm -hmm. um, we do every, everything but negotiate the settlement. But we prepare everything, make sure we have all the evidence, all the medical evidence, lost wages, and then it's, um, it goes to the attorney. They, so they take it from For them. example, in a workers' compensation case, Elliot might, through one of the attorney's um, information, prepare a demand letter and send it out. But once the letter goes out, the attorney will negotiate it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the divorce. And mm -hmm. absolutely with auto accidents, uh, Cheryl would prepare the information. It would go back to the lawyer to make sure we're including everything we want included. But then we'll negotiate the settlements. Our paralegals don't negotiate with insurance adjusters. Some firms do that. I don't think that that's the right way to handle a case. Um, do you need to explain to a client up front uh, exactly what the parameters of your paralegal are and what they will not be doing? Do you have to explain that to each well, we client? talk to the client about contact with the paralegal. If they, I will tell a client, if you want to know what's going on with your case and you can't get me, feel free to talk to the paralegal. Um, I would assume the client would hire me for me to do the work. So right. I do the work that would be expected of me by the client. But the background work, I think they understand that um, all the stuff to prepare me to be able to do that is done by the paralegals. And from your perspective as a business person owning a law firm, they're there to assist, make it more efficient, and carry the day-to-day -day operations of a case, as you're saying. Um, that saves you time, saves the client some money, or does it not? In, and how does it? In certain types of cases, it absolutely saves the client money. For example, in divorce cases, if we're doing it on an hourly fee, um, even though I may not be worth more than Cindy, we charge considerably more for my yeah. time than for yes. her time. So I would think a smart client would want Cindy to be typing the letters who types much quicker and, and more efficiently than I do, um, and me signing them than opposed to um, me typing my own letters. And you explain this to clients that yes. th these are among their competencies, feel comfortable about having them being the point person. Right. It's never been an issue in any case I've ever handled with any clients as to what work the paralegal's doing versus what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. What's usually um, more of an issue is how the paralegals have to deal with clients routinely and regularly. And sometimes 
too much. Sometimes clients should get bills more often to show that when you're bugging the paralegal about things that you shouldn't be bugging the paralegal about, it's costing you time and money, and it's taking them away from their ability to do the work for everyone else. A perfect segue into what was going to be my next question, <laughs> which is how, and I guess we'll address the paralegals first, how do you um, encourage or help your clients, their clients, your clients, um, deal with you more effectively that saves them time and money and saves you unnecessary time? How do you work with them to make it move more smoothly? What might you suggest to the clients? Well, I always, um, when a client, when I first meet a client, uh, it's usually after they met with uh, the attorney and they're coming in because they want to proceed with a divorce and I'll go over all the information with them and uh, I will give them my business card and tell them if they have any questions just contact me and if I need to get in touch with the attorney to answer the questions I will or if they need to speak with the attorney I'll give it to the attorney to call them. Um, I deal with uh, divorce clients a lot um, if they have problems, they usually call me and let me know what their problems are, and then I refer that to the attorney, and we decide what we're going to do from there. And would you likely tell your clients what to put in the shoebox that they're going to be bringing in in terms of the documentation or whatever it is that they need to, for you to sort through, and you and David or Jackie to sort through? Yeah, I usually um, let them know that uh, for Social Security, we have to keep up with their, their treatment. Um, but it's not always necessary to, to speak to them every time they call. So I let them know that, okay, if you don't speak to me, you can leave the information on my voicemail and I'll get back to them as soon as I can. Do they save um, money that way, Cindy? I mean, excuse me, Cheryl. excuse me, Cheryl. Well, I, you know, I think it does. It, it certainly saves time and, and um, being disrupted during the day with so many clients calling and, um, you know, just wanting to give you some basic information. So I think it saves money because it, it helps us to keep moving on a, on a claim that we're working on, but at the same time still give, um, you know, professional customer service. Yeah, we listen to them. Every time I take yeah. a phone call or they walk in, I, I listen to what's going on and I assure them that we're there to help them. And, and because I, I deal with a lot of um, people that I've heard at work, they're depending on that weekly check and that, those benefits or those medical treatment. Um, so it's important um, that we get what they need as far as their weekly check or getting in to see the doctor. And just to um, let them know that I, we care and we're there to help them and I'm listening to them and I'll do my best to, you know, to get their answers. Curious, just for comparison's sake, um, on a given day, Cindy, how many cases might you be working on? depends on what we have to what I have to do um, opening up a divorce file can take an hour or longer depending on the type of motions that have to go along with it um, I don't know maybe 10 cases it could be as many as yeah, yeah. It, it, it it's kind of hard yeah. if they're yeah. preparing for a trial Try. that's no. going to take much longer you might work mm. on one case in a day on that if you're doing letters to get medical bills or things like that, you could probably work on 20 or 30 mm -hmm. cases in a day. So by comparison or in contrast, how about you on a given day, David? How many cases would you be juggling? It, it depends. Again, it depends, it depends whether court. I'm in court or not. <laughs> if I'm in court, I usually have one or two or three cases max, and you're concentrating on those cases at that particular time. Um, then you can be working on 20, 30, 40 cases at a time because you're looking at the phone calls, the messages, the um, immediate fire that has to be put out and you're just going from one thing to the next and so you don't have time to count them. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good answer, David. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the um, what's called an ethical wall. Explain what that is. Right, and by that do you mean um, in terms of what the client's information to be shared with other yes, people is? Yes. All right, and yes. we talked a little bit about that because th so. th there's also sometimes people confuse that with the wall or the curtain um, when one lawyer might have a case where there's a potential conflict, conflict. Mm -hmm. so that you can't share information. But that's not something that happens in our firm too often. Um, the paralegals are just bound by the same rules of confidentiality that the lawyers are and everyone else in the firm from the receptionist um, down to the lawyers, as I would say, <laughs> um, is that you don't bre breach confidentiality 
confidentiality of information that you have of about a client. So talking about it within the office uh, to work on someone's case, we have to do that, but nothing goes outside of the office. And I ask that because, of course, theoretically, just because there are, is more than one person working on it, a client might reasonably not specifically challenge you or think that there's anything wrong with you, but just by virtue of the fact that there's communication, which is necessary, that they right. should be assured of that. And do you need to assure them of that? Do most clients uh, even maybe, question that? Maybe, but I, I don't see it that often. And to me, it wouldn't be any different than if you go to see a doctor and they have a medical assistant in the room. Um, you just assume that that's part of what has to happen for you to be treated correctly by the doctor. Same thing for the lawyer to handle your case effectively. Mm -hmm. So apart from the fact that these are well-trained but not quite lawyers, um, do they have any limitations in terms, or I should say, any accountability? What kind of accountability is there about what might go wrong with whatever they're doing? Theoretically, there should be nothing wrong because you're eyeballing everything and well, signing well, off on it. The lawyer is totally responsible for anything that happens in the office and on the files that they're working on. So if a mistake is made, it's not their mistake, it's our mistake, and we take responsibility for that. Which, again, the reason I ask that is because I can certainly see where uh, your client, well, clients need to know, they want to be reassured of that. And on a given day, is there a certain time or way where you interact with a group of or a single paralegal? How do, do you have a debriefing session that happens in the morning or well, in the afternoon? No, I wouldn't say we do this regularly, but each department in our office has monthly or several monthly meetings um, to go over different issues, different things that are new in the area of the practice that they're in, or things to be aware of, or particularly difficult cases that we want to discuss. So we used to have regular office meetings and everything, but we've broken it down more by department mm -hmm. now. They also have an um, open door policy that whenever we need to come and discuss anything, a case or, or a procedure or whatever, it, the doors are always open. So. Um, they're and always, you know, willing to sit down and meet whenever. If the door's closed, which sometimes they get closed, we take budge right in. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to have that kind of flexibility. Um, I understand, uh, I don't know that it's the case in your particular law firm, but there are times that paralegals may be not contract and working for you as an employee, but rather as a freelance. Uh, is there a difference, and how should someone uh, respond to that? Have you ever done I, independent I, that's contract? That's more like consulting work. Right. It's have have like any of you ever done any of that? No. no. Is there no. any reason that someone should be uh, concerned about that or alarmed by that? No, and because here is a situation. I mean, very rarely, but if we have someone who's going to be out for a long period of time, but we know they're coming back. Um, we might go to a staffing company and say, bring somebody in. So we may be paying the staffing company directly rather than that person. We consider them part of our law firm. They're, we're still responsible for their work. It doesn't change how the work is done in the office or anything of that nature. Um, so there are, I know there are some paralegals who don't have enough work at one particular place, so they will go from a, to a couple of different attorneys and do work whether they're independent contractors or employees of more than one lawyer, the lawyer is still responsible for their work. And should a client um, who comes to you ask, just as he ask, might ask of you, what's your background in this particular aspect of law, would they also, um, would you be inclined to say, we've chosen Cheryl for this case versus Cindy for that because Cheryl's more steeped and more familiar with this particular kind of of law or has done more cases We could and certainly such. do that. Um, but in it, reality? And it would be a, a great sales point for us to be able to say, well, not only are you hiring me, but you're hiring Cheryl, who's been doing this, I won't say since what year, um, and Cindy, um, or Elia, or that Elia speaks Portuguese and some Spanish. Um, those are all great selling points. Clients don't generally ask that, but I do, I mean, if I have a client who speaks Portuguese, Elia might be in there or Vera anyway, um, so they know that. Would a client ever come to you and say, David, I know you're the high-priced lawyer. Uh, can I have the paralegal do 99 and 44 per hundreds percent of the work so I can save a few euros, shekels, no. nickels? Um, I, I think it, it's more in terms of what is appropriate for the case. And they trust me if they hire me or the other lawyers in the office to make that determination so that they're treated fairly but the work is done correctly. Off the record or not, um, when you work with paralegals, even though they are not allowed to give the client legal advice, do you ever discuss with them 
um, the case and gather some information or ideas or perspectives of theirs to add to the overall decision-making process that you come up with? I would say all the time. So, for example, if we have a workers' compensation case, and I, it's a little bit different, I might say to Elliot, have we had something like this? Do you remember anything? Their memories are better than mine. Um, Cheryl, I might go to and ask a question about this injury. What do you, th I'll ask all of them actually, because with auto injury cases and personal injury cases, it's really more of what a jury would award, and they're m much more in touch with some of that sometimes than a lawyer might be. Um, what do you think this case is worth? So we might have that discussion, but for me, having handled all of these cases and have had you know, jury verdicts and seen what they're worth, I might reserve final judgment, but I'll always ask their opinion. Good to know. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you uh, in the situation of going to a court with them if you're in a divorce case, um, Cindy, or if you're doing bankruptcy or whatever, do you go with the lawyers to the um, courtroom? I haven't in this law firm, but I have in another law firm. Yeah, and, yeah, and we have taken lawyers mm -hmm. on um, jury trials, I mean paralegals, mm -hmm. um, on jury trials for assistance and, you know, they know what's in the file. I need to get that medical affidavit right away. You know, they, they can locate it, they can take notes, they can give pointers and make sure that you're focused in on what you need to be focused on. Mm -hmm. So we have done that. Um, in family court, um, it's a trial to a judge. Uh, and it's prepared with the paralegal's assistance, but the lawyer goes in and tries those cases. Would e any either of you or any of you be involved when there's the uh, final discussion of contract uh, resolution or what the negotiation settlement's going to be? Would you be with the lawyers at that signing or at that final agreement? Uh, no, we usually uh, get the information from them. We prepare the final documents, but we don't usually sit with them um, on occasion, we will um, sit with them for a release, but only at the, again, after the, the attorney speaking with the client, and the client knows that they're going to be sitting with us and just signing the papers. But the settlement information has already been discussed with the attorney. And, so. and there is one big exception um, to that, which would be on a will signing. Um, where you need witnesses and the paralegals oftentimes will serve as the witnesses on those documents and we've had cases that um, sometimes I want my paralegal to sit with the person who may be elderly and have some issues and make sure that the person understands what they're doing and we document that. Sounds like they have certainly have plenty to do and you're wonderful at guiding them so I think at this point the short amount of time we have to wrap up I would like to once again thank Odette Bazaar Cadero Grasso Law Firm in East Providence for hosting this public education, this public outreach that they have um, for the past couple of years, David Bazaar and the paralegals, um, Cheryl, Cindy, and Elia. We thank you so much for being part of this and thank you for tuning in. We would like to tell you that um, we'll be uh, pursuing this topic and a few others in the upcoming weeks. We appreciate your tuning in and hope that you'll continue to do so as our discussion of legal matters will continue. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.